Welcome to Far More Colorado. I'm Nancy Ulrich, your host. My guest today is Senator Michael Johnson, whose district is encompasses Northeast Denver. That's right. Welcome, Senator Johnson. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. You're sitting in it, our district right now, so oh. welcome to Senate District 33. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a different district. That's right. Tell me about your district. It's quite large. It is quite large and quite diverse. I think it's one of the most fun districts in the state. I'm a little biased, of course, but uh, I represent everything from downtown Denver out to the Denver International Airport, everything north of Colfax. So we have Five Points, we have City Park, we have Park Hill, Stapleton, Montbello, Green Valley Ranch. We have great things like the, the Denver Zoo and the Science Museum, uh, the airport, all in our district. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of great, uh, great places to have fun in, in District you 33. You certainly do. A lot of places to take young kids, too, it turns out. Yes. Five Points is undergoing a resurgence. It is. A major resurgence in Curtis Park as well. My daughter goes to preschool in that neighborhood, and so there's a lot of exciting things happening there. I'm very um, pleased to know about um, all the good things that seem to be coming up about Five Points because yes. it's a beautiful area. It is a beautiful area, incredible sense of history. A lot of people, I think, don't know uh, um, about the history that sits right outside their back door in Five Points, our own little Harlem Renaissance there in the Five Points. When you look at some of the history of writers and authors and civic leaders and activists that have been active there, and even today, you know, you look at folks like Brother Jeff and uh, who are still doing amazing work in cultural centers and community leadership down there. There's a lot happening. I am determined to get Brother Jeff for an interview. As you should. I haven't reached out to him yet. I, I'll be happy to call and, and beg on your behalf. He's well, a good friend. Well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, good. I've met him before several times, but it's been a while since I've seen him. I'm a big fan of his. All right. Uh, in that, mentioning Montbello, et cetera, there's a bit of crime problems. There's a bit of foreclosure problems, which I understand yes. may have eased recently. How's, how's yeah. the econo economy in that part of the city now? I mean, I think that's one thing we find in common across all parts of the state is that continues to be the single biggest issue for our district is people trying to find jobs and find jobs that will pay a, a livable wage and, and make sure to, that they can pay the bills. And so we do have, we're blessed with a lot of good new business growing up in our districts. There's a new SMA was a big firm that came here, which is which makes uh, solar converters, which came out there. We do have some great long-term companies like Prologis and others that are based in the far northeast. Um, but we do have, you know, we're working harder and harder to make sure all of our young people have the skills they need and the education they need to get jobs. And also folks that are coming out of the prison system and coming back into our communities that they have the training and support they need to be successful. And so that interplay of job creation and uh, you know, criminal justice and the ability to make sure people are coming in with the skills, whether it's coming out of the K-12 system or out of our college system or even out of our correction system, uh, that's, one of our, that's one of our most significant issues. There's really so much going on societally and so much of it is tied to education. Um, yes. I'm, I, unfortunately, I did leave some notes on the other committees you're involved with. Mention a couple of those. You bet. So I, I chair the Senate Finance Committee. So we oversee all of the state's financial issues as well as all the tax uh, policy questions. Uh, and then I sit on the Judiciary Committee. So all the issues that you mentioned around criminal justice and safety, um, I'm involved with. And then I vice chair the Education Committee. So really, criminal justice, finance, and education are my three big areas of focus. Well, and of course, education has been a major concern and Part of your life for several years. It has years, been part of my life for a long time. I was a high school principal for six years before I came to the Senate and a high school English teacher before that. And so education has been uh, the major drive of my career, but with a major focus on serving in communities where we're trying hard to create opportunity for kids and for families. And so I think there's been a really natural connection between not just the educational issues, but the economic development issues, because what you find is it's great to have kids prepared with a wonderful education, but if there aren't really great jobs in that community for them to take, then they end up leaving. We don't want them to do that either. We want to, we want to keep our talent right here in Colorado. Yeah, exactly. We really do. Um, last year, you were, last session, you yes. were involved with Amendment 66. You're yes. a major proponent of it. And for some of us, it was a big disappointment that yes. it did not pass. Um, Major disappointment for me. So it's, yes. you know, that and the Broncos loss of uh, Super Bowl have made the last six months pretty hard for me. Oh, um, dear. Both big losses for the state. But, yeah, I mean, I think that we've learned a lot and tried to take a lot of time to talk with voters about what it is that they didn't like and what their challenges were. And as you probably know, 
The issues for Amendment 66 were not just about funding for schools. We know that Colorado is one of the lowest funded states in the country on school spending, but it was also about really the constitutional uh, Gordian knot that we have here and the, and the conflict of Tabor and Amendment 23 and Gallagher. And what it meant was that it makes it very hard for us to be able to invest in education, you know, and because over the last 30 years, we've cut about three and a half billion dollars out of our K-12 investment because of Tabor mm -hmm. and because of Gallagher. And so I think people don't realize that there are constitutional problems we have to resolve here. You're seeing them even this week around the new marijuana tax. Even this new marijuana tax that we passed because of Tabor, we may not, we may not be able to keep the taxes we've just collected. Uh, and so I think there are just structural problems in the Constitution that we're going to have to fix, even regardless of how, whether or not folks believe we should spend more money on K-12. But we have spent a lot of time since that listening to the two major pieces of feedback we got, which were, one, we want to see you do more investment in K-12, but we want you to try to do it with existing revenue. And the second is we think it's really important to have this be bipartisan and not be a partisan issue. And so I've worked with some people this year and we've brought back a proposal called the Student Success Act, which will be an investment in K-12 education that will use only existing resources and has broad bipartisan support. And so we're hopeful that we'll be able to make at least one step forward this year in the legislature. Um, many people that I talk to put this blame of costs of running public schools on the shoulders of uh, administration costs. Mm -hmm. um, do you foresee a way of perhaps increasing productivity in that area? So this is one of the parts of Amendment 66 that was so important and people were so uh, attached to that we've kept in this current proposal, which is providing full financial transparency on how districts spend their dollars and particularly on how much those dollars go right down to the school level. So our, our, all the voters I talked to wanted to know, you know, will these dollars get to the classroom? And so we will, for the first time, propose a system that says in Colorado, you as a parent or a grandparent or a taxpayer would be able to go online and see in a very easy to, to, uh, to report way how much is actually being spent at my son's school versus a neighboring school and what exactly do those dollars go to? How much goes to administration? How much goes to transportation or cafeteria or classroom services or pensions? Whatever people would like to see as the investment, we would have all that available for the first time. So that's part of what we want to make sure is possible is that folks know where exactly the dollars go and how they're spent. So if they want to advocate for us to spend them differently, they can do that. Well, and at the same time, the budget for the state of Colorado is handcuffed by the fact that there are certain um, bills that have to be paid first. That's correct. So that becomes another factor in what we're trying to accomplish as a state. It does, and this was one of the reasons why we pushed Amendment 66, was we wanted to have a comprehensive solution that would serve K-12, but that would also make sure we could make adequate investments into things like higher education to keep college affordable, or into our correction system to make sure we can do the kind of mental health support and treatment for those inmates, not just warehousing them. Uh, the kind of parole supervision to make sure we don't have folks committing crimes once they're out released. Uh, uh, the support for economic development. And there are a lot of priorities in the state budget. And what happens now is everyone fights over the same set of, of crumbs, which means we end up doing a lot of these services poorly. Uh, and I, I think people are frustrated by that. And so one of the reasons why we're trying to find a comprehensive solution is to say this is not just about K-12. K-12 is an important uh, priority. It's not the only priority. And we have to be able to balance all the rest of those as well. One of the bills that's been introduced, um, a House bill, is the Student Success Act. Yes. Uh, what, could go ahead and talk about that. So that's the bit. one I was just talking about, which okay. is that's the pros we, we've been working on the last couple of months uh, to try to figure out what we could do to try to invest in schools this year um, to make sure we could get them some resources out of our existing budget. And what we did is we looked uh, hard to pull money from a little bit of the uh, money that's coming in new from the economic recovery as a little bit more revenue comes into the state. We'll prioritize that. There is some money we'll use from the marijuana funds. There's some money we'll use from one-time reserve funds to be able to prioritize spending in K-12. What we're going to target is, A, giving districts back some of the dollars we cut during the recession to make sure they can do things like hire back teachers they had to let go or restart programs they had to eliminate, but also giving them the, the um, those resources to help support early literacy uh, in particular to make sure all kids enter fourth grade ready to read and ready to learn. Targeting some support for students who are learning English as a second language is really important. Targeting some capital construction dollars for our rural districts where we have schools that are falling apart and are no longer safe uh, for kids. And then making sure that districts have the dollars they need to implement all the incredible things Colorado has started that are so important like developing new standards, our new assessments, our new evaluations for teachers and principals. These are all really 
national leading exemplars in which Colorado is taking charge, but we want to make sure we do those well and we have the resources to train people and support them. So uh, that's what the Student Success Act is about and we're very proud that it has very broad bipartisan support and uh, we think we'll be able to make a really historic investment in K-12 this year. Well, how does this core curriculum that's um, been coming into play uh, work into what Colorado wants to do. Yep, so the, the Colorado uh, Board, our State Board of Education, decided about two years ago to adopt the Colorado Academic Standards, which were a set of standards that include all content areas, history, science, language arts, math, art. Um, and they chose on two of those categories to adopt standards that are, that are shared with other states, just in language arts and with math. Um, and they also uh, have decided, and the legislature voted uh, overwhelmingly two years ago to say, instead of every one of the 50 states paying for and building and administering their own tests. Why don't we uh, n negotiate with other states around us to do a joint assessment, just like the SAT or the ACT, which our kids could use. It would give us a better sense for not just how do our kids in Alamosa compare to our kids in Aspen, but how do kids in Colorado compare to kids in California or in Massachusetts or in uh, the rest of the country. And so we've done that. The, the schools are currently implementing those standards. Uh, they are clearer and higher standards than what we had before. The teachers I've talked to really uh, like them instead of just simple pencil and paper fill in the bubble tests. It's now more about critical thinking, uh, complex analysis. Can you make sense of text and, and come up with creative ideas around them? And so I think it's gonna be really great for Colorado. Um, anytime you implement something new, it takes some transition and we're in the middle of that transition now. Uh, but I think we're on the path to uh, really a, a great new improvement with those uh, standards. I hate to stay on education, but it's such it's okay. a big topic and you're so well versed in it. <laughs> uh, one of my concerns really is that children entering the school system need to learn English. Yes. And I, you know, I'm all in favor of native tongues being mm -hmm. kept. That's mm -hmm. not my objection at all. But um, when you see that people that come here from a foreign country that have learned English and succeeded, mm -hmm. um, it really helps their long time career and yeah. so forth also. I, I found, you know, I spent six years as a high school principal for those uh, in a high school that had a large percentage of students that were non-native English speakers. And I found that almost everybody agrees on that. The parents who are, who, are, who are recent immigrants are as anxious for their kids to learn English as you are and I am. And they get the same thing. They brought them here because they think there's real opportunity here. And they think the only way you get access to that opportunity is by being able to speak the language. And so I think we all have a sense of urgency to make sure kids acquire English skills. What we also found is that they did a, a survey of the parts of the state budget that are underfunded. And they found, the audit found, that the single most underfunded area of almost all of our departments and funding is resources for students to acquire English, to learn English. And so that's one of the reasons why in the Student Success Act, we've targeted some dollars to English language learners is to make sure they get those resources, they learn English, so they're able to be successful not just in school, but in, you know, at the grocery store, at the voting booth, uh, you know, at the, at the chapel, wherever they are with their friends and well, community members. Well, in their job dealing with the public. That's right. I and, mean, you know, you don't, we, don't leave, we don't live in an isolated little space. That's we right. have to communicate every day. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, I understand that I don't have too much knowledge about it, but Denver has a school called the Bridge School where they try and encourage folks that are coming into the community with uh, foreign language uh, the children go there and they are able to then focus on the uh, transition from their native tongue to English. A number of schools have some pl places call them immersion programs or bridge programs where they say what you want to do is first immerse them in English, get them proficient enough to be able to function in a regular classroom and then mainstream them back into those classrooms. And so there are a number of places that do that and have some real success with it. Uh, another topic that does relate to education is, is preschool yes. education. Um, there's, hopefully people are beginning to realize that three and four year olds really do need that education and possibly a more formal yes. setting than just being home and uh, perhaps not getting quite enough stimulation in the right direction. You know, this is one of the parts of Amendment 66 that I was so passionate about as we were proposing full day kindergarten for all children in the state, which we don't have now. And we were proposing funding for, for preschool, for high quality preschool options for three and four year olds. And so we also have a bill that we're working on with that, which I'll introduce in the next couple of weeks, which is an, a way to try to fund preschool uh, without raising taxes. And the idea is, as you have probably said, and other folks have always said to me before, we know it makes far more sense to invest in preschool than it does to invest in prisons 15 years later, right? And so the, 
the Frederick Douglass quote is, uh, we are better off to, to build strong children than to repair broken adults, right? And so uh, what we're gonna do this session is we're gonna work on uh, a social uh, investment structure that says we'll put in dollars, either from foundations or philanthropists, to fund early childhood education, to fund preschool for three and four year olds. And when those three and four year olds grow up, to now not need additional state resources because they don't need special ed support, so they don't need literacy support, so they don't need additional social services contacts because they're now reading. Then the savings that the state generates from not having to pay those future costs will use to pay back the investment to, to start early childhood. So it's an innovative approach a couple of states have tried, and we really want to prove to the public and to the legislators that this is not just the right moral thing to do, it's actually the right financial thing to do. It's going to be better economics for us to invest in early childhood than it is to wait and pay the cost of interventions later on. Yeah. Um, are there, is there another topic that, uh, you know, I, I, we've dwelt on education yes. quite a bit, but I'm sure there are other topics that you would like to yeah, there, discuss? There are numbers. Two, uh, two other big topics, obviously, in the, in the finance world that I'm involved in uh, as chair of finance. One is we're trying to look at uh, what we call the Main Street Fairness Act, which is what are we going to do to try to help make sure that there's an equal tax burden on both our brick and mortar businesses in the middle of our cities and our online businesses in Colorado. So right now, if you go buy a book from Tattered Cover, you pay a 2.9% sales tax. If you buy a book from Amazon, you don't pay any sales tax which means Amazon has a big advantage over Tattered Cover when Tattered Cover is in our neighborhood paying employees that are our neighbors, paying sales tax, property tax, income tax. They're supporting all of the civic infrastructure of the state. And so we're trying to establish um, uh, a fairness there where you would pay the same sales tax whether you shop online or you shop in person to help support our local businesses. Uh, and people, most businesses have been very good partners and been willing to do that. Places like Apple or Barnes and Noble already, whether you buy it online or you buy it in a store, they charge you the same tax. Um, as we get to a world where more and more sales are going online, I think if we don't do something about this, we'll see our tax base erode and our local businesses face real challenges. So I'm working with Rep Representative Court actually to sponsor uh, that bill called the Main Street Fairness Act. I'm also working on a handful of criminal justice bills. Um, uh, one that the governor already signed, which would help make it easier for people to pay restitution. So when they've come out of, of jail and they've committed a crime, and part of their parole is to make whole whatever the damage they did. So if you robbed someone, you have to pay back this material that you stole. Um, and so we want to make it easier for uh, to make sure that those defendants help make the victims whole, and also to make it easier that those defendants can actually go on with their lives and get jobs again without having to care, fe carry felony charges for a longer period of time. So that bill the governor already signed last week. And I'm working on some proposals on both trying to crack down on the number of, um, of uh, drunk driving, of drunk drivers around the state. We, we're one of the few states that doesn't make multiple repeat offenses at drunk driving a felony. So you can have eight or 10 or 12 DUIs and never face serious charges. We want to make some changes to that. Um, then we're working on a version of, uh, of what was um, Katie's law, which was a law that says if you, uh, you know, if you are someone that has been convicted of a crime, uh, that what we know is we have all sorts of unsolved murders and sexual assaults out there that we can't find that are cold cases. And one of the ways that states have been able to find uh, major cold cases by solving these crimes is by being able to, uh, to, to check the DNA of existing felons who have been convicted of charges and be able to see if, if there are people already in jail or have been convicted who are also the folks who have perpetrated these uh, rapes or these murders. And so we're trying to make it easier for victims for us to be able to collect that data and then be able to identify and solve some of these cold case murders. In New York, by doing this alone, they solve more than 300 unsolved murders and almost 1,500 unsolved rapes. And so uh, it's one of the steps we're trying to take as well. And of course, their numbers are greatly larger than much ours. Much higher than ours. We yes. only have about 60 uh, or so murders in the city of Denver all year, and so it's much smaller. Um, but I do think that what we know is there are a large number of cold cases out there where yes. families are still waiting for justice. And um, we, those people might be at our fingertips. We just don't know it. There was a high profile one last week that Mr. Yes. Costello. So Costello went on and committed four aggravated sexual assault, aggravated rapes. We had him arrested in 2003. Uh, if we had, if our bill was in place then, his DNA would have come up right away and you would have caught him in 2008 before those other three rapes happened. And so our goal is we want to keep people safe and make some common sense steps to do that. We think there's a way to do it. Early on, you mentioned that DIA is part of your section, yes. which of course is an annexed part of 
the city in Canada, Denver. It is, Denver. the long peninsula up there. Yes, but there's so much growth and so much happening there. We just have to talk about that. There's the uh, light rail will be a reality. It's, it's incredibly way, exciting. Way too long away for me, uh, but... I know, we've been waiting, but I, every day I get to drive by there and I see the progress and it's getting pretty exciting. And yeah, I think that you know people forget what an incredible economic engine DIA is, you know, in terms of not just the number of jobs, but the number of businesses it attracts in and around that area. And so one of the great benefits of us landing this direct flight from Denver to Japan, which the mayor uh, helped, helped create, was that now we have Japanese businesses who would have located in San Francisco or in Chicago who would love to have a manufacturing plant or love to have their a Central American office right in Denver because they can go direct from Tokyo to DIA, hop off the plane, and right there in Green Valley Ranch or Montbello is a corporate headquarters. Uh, and so uh, DIA is a tremendous economic engine for us, very excited about the hotel that's going in there, the conference center, as well as about the new light rail. I think that's going to help traffic tremendously and also going to make it much easier for folks to get from the airport to and from downtown. And You betcha. Uh, we're very, very excited. Actually, there's been a very um, healthy Asian-American Chamber of Commerce here in Colorado for many, many years. Yes, a very, very strong one, and we've been working uh, together with them on this, and very, they were very excited to get the flight completed, and we're very excited about this as an opportunity for building those relationships between uh, our Asian partners and, and Colorado. And, you know, on a, uh, looking at back in the history of Colorado, even though it was unfortunate to have uh, an internment camp, yeah. That has brought many Japanese to Colorado, which, you know, always surprised me when I was younger and visiting out here was, yeah. what are Japanese people doing in the middle of the country? And, and it's turning, I mean, you're right, despite the, the shame of part of it, it's turned out to be a great sign of courage for us. You look at just across the street, the, the Ralph Carr Judicial Center, which is the new courthouse named after uh, Ralph Carr, who was the governor who refused to intern uh, Japanese Americans in, in, in camps here. And so there were, there were moments of great courage uh, in that really unfortunate history. And I think that many Japanese Americans now appreciate some of the ways that, that Colorado was, was willing to fight against what was otherwise a really uh, oppressive and disappointing moment in American history. Yeah. What about the Legal Services Committee? What does that do? The Legal Services Committee is that we're kind of like the the Senate and the House's lawyers and so we oversee any legal actions that the state takes. So if we pass a bill and someone sues the state, we oversee those legal proceedings. We had a, a member, Representative Williams, who had a restraining order uh, out against someone who was harassing her, and she's being sued over that. And so, we'll, you know, we approve legal counsel for those matters. And so, it's anything from uh, it's any legal issue the state get, might get into in regards to uh, either rules. We oversee this, the rules of all the agencies, and we also oversee any lawsuits either towards us or or uh, from us. A year or so ago, Forbes magazine named you one of the seven up-and-coming educators in this country. <laughs> uh, tell me about what your plans are for the future, because eventually you'll stop being a state senator. Uh, that's true. I, um, I, I don't know that I have a, a clear plan. Along the way, I've, I've felt like there hasn't always been a clear sense of what I wanted to do next or what I thought the next role was. I've tried to stay focused on you know, what is the what is the change that you want to make rather than what is the title that you want to hold or what is the role that you want to be in. And so for me, education has been a calling for a long time and for a while that was being a teacher and then I felt like I wanted to be able to make a difference on a whole school environment. That's what led me to want to be a principal. And then there were certain policies we bumped up against as, as principals and teachers together that seemed like they really were slowing down our progress. So this was the made sense as the next step. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what might come next. I also have really loved the diversity of issues I've gotten to deal with at the state level. So a lot of the financial and constitutional issues, the criminal justice issues, everything from agriculture to water to health care to corrections. There are so many issues in the state that all connect that I love the chance to be involved in all of them. But, um, you know, I, I joke I'd always be okay to getting fired from this job because I'd love to go back and be a school principal again. So uh, uh, that's always an option too. We're drawing to the close of our interview session. So I'd like to ask you once again if there's any topic that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention. Um, I think that um, I think that probably the major topic for I think people to keep on the front of their mind is uh, how do we as a state begin to think about what it takes to untie some of this constitutional knot over the next several years and how can we find a way that's really bipartisan and grassroots to be able to say we want government in Colorado to not look like government in California where it's so constrained by constitutional barriers that they can't really manage or, or, or legislate and so I think that uh, 
we're going to have to try to find a way forward on that. I'm optimistic that we can, but I think when you look at some of the major issues to solve in the state, I think education is one. I think our constitutional infrastructure is another. I think probably water is going to be a big third. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, and then I think there's also a major, some major challenges ahead for us in infrastructure and transportation. How do we make this a state that's going to be accessible for the next 30 years to tourism and to recreation and to commerce? Uh, and we face huge challenges with not just our I-70 corridor, but our I-25 corridor there as well. And so I think we, we're entering a time where the state's going to have to have a broader conversation about where are we heading as a state and what's the vision that's going to get us there. And that's part of the thing that makes it fun for me to get out of bed in the morning is figuring out how to, how to build that. That's great. I love that. <laughs> this state has undergone a lot of changes. A lot of changes. In, a lot of them for the better, but we got, we're doing a lot of growing right now. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you, Senator Johnson, Thank you so much for, for having joining me. me I'll, I, I'll look forward to seeing you again. Yes. <laughs> thank you all for joining us for Far More Colorado. Look for us on Sunday nights at 5.30 p.m. on Channel 56 and on the Internet. You'll find us there. Goodbye for now. Far More Colorado is a public affairs interview program highlighting people of interest to Coloradans. The program has guests from our state government, and we also feature a wide variety of other guests who are making a difference here in Colorado.